Well, we're going to continue our series. We started this a couple of weeks ago on heaven. We've talked a, a while ago, we did a series on hell, but we're going to talk about heaven. We talked in the first time about heaven as being a real tangible place to live. It's been described as a city, a country, and its location is in the third heaven. We think somewhere in the north. The Bible describes somewhere in the north. And today I want to focus on the, on the greatness of heaven. Now, before I get there, I want everyone here to think of your best vacation spot that you had the best time at. I'll give you a second to think of that. Put it in your mind for a moment. We'll come back to that in a little bit. This vacation spot should be one that you remember with great appreciation. Anybody got one? And don't have to answer me yet, but why did you pick that particular one? What made that trip so memorable for you? Now keep those in the back of your mind because we're going to talk about those here in the sermon. Now I'm going to use an illustration that we went on this vacation. This was one of the better ones we've had. And I'm going to use it in a small way to kind of symbolize what we should expect in heaven. Now, this past year, not this past weekend, but back in July, we were able to go, my entire family, 16 of us, me, Anna, her mom, our girls, their significant others, all the grandkids, 16 people in one big house. We were able to get a house in the Outer Banks. And now that vacation was memorable for a lot of reasons, and I'm going to tie those into why we should be anticipating heaven as well. Well, the first thing about any vacation is you got to get there. You got to pre plan, right? When we went on this vacation, this was a matter of prayer for us because it involved a lot of things. All of our kids had jobs and uh, school and everything else, and Maddie had some surgery going on. So we had to organize and we had a plan for everyone to go. And so we prayed about it, we prayed about it, and made sure that everyone can make it for that weekend. And we prayed about God's provision for a place to stay because all the kids were helping us. We were all going to get together and share this house. And we had to pray for it. Now, if you've ever been in the Outer Banks, this is a place that you just don't show up and expect to rent a place. This is some place you have to book in advance, and most of these places are booked years in advance. And the way that most of them work is if you rent it for one year, they will give you the option, the first option, to rent it for the same time next year. And most people do that. And they're booked, you know, these same families book these places for, for years on end. In fact, we were down there. My, my son-in-law, his boss called him and said, hey, tell me about the house you're in. I'm looking to get a place and I can't find any place. And so it's very hard to get a, a, or a place down there. Everything was booked. But God had opened the door for us and allowed us to be able to get this house. If God didn't work this out, this trip would not have happened. No amount of pleading or dealing or offering money. My, my son-in-law's boss could have afforded anything, but he couldn't find anything. It was what it was. God made that trip possible. God is the one who makes heaven possible. Heaven needs pre-planning too. In other words, how do you get there? If you don't first trust Christ, you don't make your reservation, you're not going to be there. You just can't show up at the end of your life and expect to find a place in heaven. In the Outer Banks, every place is rented far in advance. You can't automatically show up and expect to rent one. You can't automatically, at the point of your death, after you die, expect to show up in heaven. You have to make sure you have a reservation. I don't know how many funerals I've done for folks, and I think I've mentioned this before, that everyone, everyone thinks that their loved one's going to heaven. No matter how wicked they may have been in their life, or how far from God they may have been in their life, everyone thinks they're going to heaven. I've never done a funeral where anyone has said, well, I know where that guy's at. He's not in heaven. Everyone thinks they're going there. But unless you have a reservation through Christ, you're not going to make it. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, For God has what? Reserved a priceless inheritance for his children. It's kept in heaven for you. So you've got to pre-plan. You've got to get there. What happens when you are there? You ever been in a garden spot, a nice tropical vacation? You go because of the scenery. Now, this past weekend, we were able to go to the mountains 
and we were able to go there. I never knew there was a Grand Canyon in PA. How many knew that? Yeah. I never knew there was an abandoned turnpike either. So, you know, and I've lived here all my life. So we got to go and we got to spend a couple of days up there and we, you go out and you see this beautiful scenery. And, and the scripture that comes to mind is heavens declare the glory of God. And you see all these beautiful mountains untouched by people and you got to go on tours and stuff. Now, normally we're, we're beach people. We like the beach. We like to walk over the sand dune and see the sand, the beautiful sand and the ocean and nice waves and stuff. And if you look, if you go down to the beach, you see all these amazing, beautiful houses that are built there. When we lived in Florida, my brother, he lives right on the, right on the water. And all those houses that are built right on the water, there's huge mansions, like, you know, just enormous. And it was one of the most beautiful places you're going to see. All those places are going to pale in comparison to what heaven is going to be like. John 14, 2 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. I like that version. Now, the house that we stayed in had seven bedrooms and eight baths. Maybe, and that was just enough. Maybe you stayed at a five-star resort, or when we were in Florida, we went to visit um, Atlantis, the part down further on south, and again, beautiful built on the water. But think about God's mansion. Imagine what God's mansion is going to be like. Hebrews 12, 22 says, You have come, come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. We're going to be in a city that God built for himself and is preparing for us. Revelation 21, 11 says, It was filled with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious gem, crystal clear like jasper. That's the city. Here, Revelation 21, 21. The 12 gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl. How many of you have a pearl necklace, ladies? Maybe they're about that big, right? An entire gate made of one pearl. And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. And we've heard streets of gold. But can you imagine the, the pavement? It's, it's gold, but it's, so, it's crystal clear. And that's the, that's the streets. That's what you walk on. Whatever beautiful surroundings you've been in will, will pale in comparison to what heaven's like. Think about the nicest place you've been and think about something that's 100 times better than that. So we got to get there. We find out what's there when we're there. And we realize that there is permanent. Now, the thing about vacations is they end, right? You may have an awe-inspiring, awesome trip, but it ends quickly. My kids, they would say, the longest week in their lives was the week before vacation, and the shortest week in their life was the week of vacation. Now, why? We don't, we don't live in the Outer Banks. We don't live in the Grand Canyon. We don't live there. We live here. Our license plate says we live here. Our driver's license says we live here. We're only there as visitors. And we know that as the week goes on, we, I don't know about you, we would count days down. Okay, we have five more days left. Okay, we have four more days left. And then the last day, there's a lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because we know we've got to go home. How would you like to stay there permanently? The kids would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live here. I'm going to live here all the time. To stay in that house or your favorite place, imagine staying there forever. When you're on vacation, you don't have to worry about bills or your job or anything else, usually. Imagine having that forever. The great thing about our life here on earth, it's the same way, only reversed. We're only visitors here. At some point, it's going to end. This, this little respite we have here is going to end. And one day, we are going to be in that great vacation spot that's permanent. And we're never going to go home. Never have to worry about going home. We don't have to count the days down. What's the song say? When we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Can you imagine living in this beautiful place, never having to go back? You know, people say, 
if someone who's passed away in heaven, would they want to come back? And my answer would be, I, I wouldn't. To trade heaven to come back here? No thanks. Philippians 3.20 says, We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. So our driver's license may say Pennsylvania, but our passport says heaven, where we're going to be. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are Christ's ambassadors. And what's an ambassador? An ambassador who lives somewhere else, but only visits for a temporary time and represents the, the leader of the country at that particular point. And we are ambassadors here. We are to represent Jesus to other people because that's where we're from. So the exciting part is that's permanent. And this is going to be a reward. 1 Peter 1.9 says, Your reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Now, when you have a vacation, you usually work up for that vacation. You spend 50 weeks a year or so working for that vacation, right? It's your reward that you give yourself for working so hard throughout the year. You save it, you, you plan for it, you put in the time, you, you do your due diligence and you just work it and your, your reward at the end of the year is that vacation. Heaven is God's reward for those who believe. Matthew 5, 12 says, Be happy about it, be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. You work hard all day, all year long for, for one week or two weeks, however long it might be. And now we're going to hit winter pretty soon. Yeah, you know me in winter. Fall, I like fall, I don't like winter. But now you got to go through winter in anticipation of what's coming next summer, the vacation that's coming. And what do you do for that? You deny yourself throughout the year to save and plan for the trip. Matthew 6.20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And that means you don't spend your money foolishly here. You save it, you plan for it, you put it aside to use that money to use on vacation. When God says we're to deny ourselves here, it means we're, we're putting away things that we would like to have here in anticipation for what's coming. You don't waste your time and your resources. You save them as you plan. In other words, you don't take a day here and a day there and squander your vac vacation week throughout the year so when summer comes, you have no vacation left. You try to save that up. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you really want a great trip, you want a great vacation, you sacrifice during the year so that when that vacation comes, you are able to have a more excellent trip. You deny yourselves in this life because you're storing up treasures, the Bible says, in heaven. Matthew 6, 19, don't store up treasures here on earth where they can be eaten by moths and get rusty or where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven. I'm going to change that and say store your treasures for heaven. So we have a vacation spot we've got to plan for. We know what's there waiting for us. And we know this trip is going to be a permanent trip. And we know it's going to be a reward for denying ourselves throughout the year and denying our lives in order to gain a better resurrection. And lastly, the most important thing, who's with you on vacation? All those things are great. The big house was great. Vacation, great. If I was in that big house by myself, I might like it for a day. By myself. Nobody around. But that would end really quickly. And that would get old. The reason we take any vacation and we call it memorable is because we have people with us. Right? How many go on vacations by yourself? No? No, you don't have to show me your hands. I know moms like to go on vacations by themselves. But usually what happens is after a few days <laughs> or a week, you kind of get to be missing the kids and maybe missing the hubby. 
I don't want to have any marriage counseling after this is over, okay? <laughs> the reason that the vacations are memorable is because who is with you? The Bible tells us we're going to have relationships in heaven. This trip to the beach was memorable because everybody was with us. I mean, everybody in our family was with us. I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures that talk about relationships in heaven. You all know when baby, or David had, Bathsheba had the baby with David and God said the baby's going to die. 2 Samuel 12, 23 says, Why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he will not return to me. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say one day I'll be in heaven. It says one day I will be with him. He will be reunited with his son. He's not going to be on the other side of heaven. You're not going to know about it. David says, I'm going to be reunited with my son. Relationship. Matthew 8, 11. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. So we have the patriarchs, and each of them have their own identity. We're going to see Abraham in person. We're going to see Isaac. We're going to see Jacob. And more importantly, those three were having a meal with themselves. Abraham got to eat with his son. Isaac got to eat with his son. Abraham got to eat with his grandson. Relationship. They were together. Matthew 17, 3. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Now, Matthew, they, they recognized who they were. How they recognized them, we don't know. I'm sure they didn't have a Polaroid of uh, Moses and Elijah. But they knew who they were. They knew who they were from old. Jonathan Edwards says this, The special affection that the saints have in this world toward other saints who are their friends will in some respect remain in the other world. Pastor John Ryland, whose wife asked him a question, she says, John, will you know me in heaven? Betty, he replied, I have known you well here, and I shall not be a bigger fool in heaven than I am now. Therefore, I will certainly know you there. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the call of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, all the Christians who have died will rise from the graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive will remain on the earth and will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with them forever. Now, Paul was writing this to the Thessalonians because they were concerned that Jesus had not returned, and yet some of the believers had died. So G, uh, Paul was saying, look, don't worry about that, because at some point, God is going to come back. Jesus is going to come back, and look at verse 17, it says, together with them. So the people who died, who were in the grave, are going to be reunited with the people that were still alive at that particular moment. People are going to have relationships in heaven. People are going to know each other in heaven. People are going to be familiar to each other in heaven. Do you want to go there alone? One of the hardest things is seeing your family not know Christ. Knowing that at some point, after you die, and if they don't know Christ, you're not going to see them again. Heaven will be a great place, and you won't, I don't believe you're going to remember that. But man, I'm here. I want them to be with me. And I know you're, you want your friends and your family to be with you. And that's why we need to be sure that we're doing all we can to introduce them to Jesus. Not only will we see our family there and be reunited with them, as David said, we'll be reunited with those who have gone on before now, here's an interesting thing. I've never thought about, I've thought about this a while. Don't know if it's true or not. How many of you like time travel movies? I'm a big time travel. I, would, I mean, you have time travel, I'm your first volunteer. And usually what happens is, in those time travel movies, when they come back, nothing has changed. Now, think about this for a minute. It's going to get a little thick here. 
God is outside of time, right? He is not surrounded by time. He is outside of time. Think about this. What if, since God's outside of time, everybody who dies, no matter when they die, they all arrive at the same time because God's outside of time. Now, the Bible talks about, you know, Sheol or Hades being the place of the dead and you got the good side and you got the bad side. The good side is with Jesus right now and that's paradise. But one day we'll all be in heaven. I don't know how that's going to look other than the fact that we're going to know each other. And that should motivate us to do all that we can to bring others to Christ. I mean, look at the world now. It's a mess. This country's a mess, right? But man, what, what better opportunity to lead someone to Jesus during this time where things are so confusing and so acrimonious everywhere? It's just, it's rough. And we need to be sure that we're doing all we can to do that. And whether they get there at the same time we do or not, I want to be sure that they're there. Another thing is we are going to see Jesus as he is. How many of you have a picture of Jesus somewhere in your house or office? I got one in my office. We all have our image of Jesus. We all have an idea of what he may look like. In fact, my wife saw something on the internet yesterday that uh, some computer generated picture of Jesus, given all the, the, you know, being Middle Eastern, being Jewish and all that. He tried to formulate what he might have looked like. Again, we don't know. But one day we will know. And I'm going to say, am I going to close? No, I'm not going to close with this. But I'm going to read this. Colin Smith shares this story. He said, there's a beautiful story, a true story, of a man by the name of William Montague Dyke. When William was 10 years old, he was blinded in a serious accident. Despite his disability, he graduated from university with high honors. And while he was in school, William fell in love with the daughter of a high-ranking British naval officer, and they became engaged. Shortly before the wedding, William had cutting edge for that time, eye surgery, in the hopes that his operation would restore his sight. If the surgery failed, he had no other option. William would remain blind for the rest of his life. After the operation, William's eyes were swathed with bandages, and he insisted on keeping the bandages on his face until the day of his wedding. If the surgery is successful, he said to a surgeon, I want the first person I see to be my new wife. The wedding day arrived and the guests assembled in a cathedral in England to witness the couple taking their vows. William's father and doctor had performed the surgery, stood next to the groom, whose eyes were still covered with the bandages. The organ trumpeted the traditional wedding march and the bride walked down the aisle to the front of the church. As soon as he arrived at the altar, the surgeon took a pair of scissors out of his pocket and cut the bandages from William's eyes. Tension filled the room and the congregation held their breath as they waited to find out if William could see the woman standing before him. Then as he stood face to face with his new bride, William's word echoed through the cathedral. You are more beautiful than I ever imagined. One day the bandages will cover, that cover our eyes will be removed. And we will see Jesus as he is. At that moment, faith will be turned to sight. And when you see his glory, it will be greater than you ever imagined. Going back to the vacation. Whatever great vacation you've taken in the past or may take in the future, there's no comparison to what heaven is going to be like. 1 Corinthians 2.9, again, we read this last week. However, it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Think about those who have gone on before us with Christ. Think about what they are enjoying right now. This beautiful, golden street, pearled place. Magnificent setting permanent, never having to come back, never having to experience any hardship or suffering. They get to talk to Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. Perfect place. You have your reservation? 
You want to see what heaven's really like? There's only one way to do that. Do you want your family and friends to be with you? How you answer those questions are going to determine your future. Because that's a future that waits for everyone. The Bible says we all have eternal life. It's just where we choose to spend it. Would you stand as we close this morning? Would you close your eyes for a moment? You know, whenever a day goes by where you don't hear about someone dying unexpectedly or someone who has had a lengthy illness that we knew would come to that point. The point is we never know when it's time, our time. But if, we're per- if we are preparing for heaven, then we have to make sure that everything is prepared for us. And that means we have to do what God tells us we have to do. We have to make a reservation. And the only way to make that reservation is to come to Christ. The Bible says we're all sinners. The Bible also tells us that the wages of sin is death. In other words, if you die in your sin, you'll not be in heaven. But the Bible also goes on to say the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I never want to assume that everyone who comes to church every Sunday automatically knows Christ. I did that for three years. Everyone thought I was a Christian. But I wasn't. So you may be in this church for many years and you're not a believer yet. But there has to come a point in your life where you have to make that choice. Church attendance isn't going to get you into heaven. Being a good person is not going to get you into heaven. The only thing that's going to get you into heaven is admitting that you are a sinner. In and of yourself, you have nothing that is worthy of heaven. But then you have to realize that God sent Jesus to take your punishment for you, to pay all your debt, to take all your sins away, And because of that, now you are righteous and worthy of heaven. But you have to do more than just think it in your mind. You have to believe it in your heart. You have to come to a point where you humble yourself and say, Yes, Lord, I know I can't make it on my own. I need to trust in what Jesus did for me as the only reason that I can come into heaven. If you're here and you've never done that, you've never really acknowledged Christ as your Savior, confess your sins, and trust in Him for forgiveness, and you want to do that, I want you to raise your hand right now. If you're watching us online and you've never done that, I'm going to pray with you. Father, I thank you for those that may be watching who've in their hearts said they want to know Christ. I pray that you would allow them to really enter into a relationship with you, that you would allow them to confess their sins, acknowledge you as the only reason that they have been forgiven and are now worthy of heaven. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you let them understand and realize And let the Spirit of God come in them and understand the change that's taken place in their heart. It's like a light bulb going off in their head, Lord. I pray that they would really see the transformation in their life by simply believing upon the name of Jesus. For those of us here and those of us who may be watching at home who have already accepted Christ, I pray that, God, you would continue to fill us with the burden and really the heartache of reaching people who don't know you. 
Give us that opportunity, Lord. Give us that desire. Burn that in us. Let it be our overriding issue in our life that keeps us focused upon you. All the things around us, Lord, are going on, and they're going to continue to go on regardless. But help us to be of single mind, of winning people, and living a life that's righteous for you. Now, Lord, I pray your blessings upon those who are watching as well as those who are here. And allow us to leave transformed and encouraged by the Spirit of God. Father, we do love you this morning, and we're so grateful for all you've done for us. Help us just to live our lives the best that we can. And when we ask all these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Have a tremendous week. Have a great day off tomorrow if you're going to be cooking. My phone number is in the book. <laughs> <laughs>